Okay, good morning. Um, we are going to start. Hello. Welcome um, to our early first of the day session. My name is Christine Young. I use she, her, hers pronouns. And I'm an associate professor at the University of San Francisco and a freelance director and dramaturg specializing in new plays about the social issues affecting women's lives. My name is Natalie Green. I use she, her, hers pronouns. I also teach at the University of San Francisco as an adjunct in the dance program, which is a part of the Department of Performing Arts and Social Justice. Outside of USF, I am the artistic director of a San Francisco-based devised theater ensemble, Mugwumpin. Uh, and we had the opportunity to collaborate on two shows, uh, devise ensemble created pieces of theater in the same year. And that's part of why we're here, because we finished that whirlwind year and thought, we learned some things. Let's share those. Great. So, um, so what we're going to share with you today is a kind of structural model that we've sort of invented in our own minds um, that came from working on these two shows back to back. They had many similarities. They had many differences. Both were really successful uh, in two ways. One, because they allowed the artistic ensemble members to have a high degree of artistic decision making for quite a long time throughout the process. And then also they were both really aesthetically strong works that had coherence, legibility, and vitality on stage. Um, so we wanna, we were sort of struck by that. How do we sort of magically balance our process and product goals in these two projects? So we're gonna share some of the um, discoveries we made with you. And we wanna also claim that this model is a feminist directing model, or really a, a model of feminist directing and feminist dramaturgy. And we'll tell you more about how we define those terms. So we all know that it's a balancing act. I think probably everyone at this conference understands multiple ways uh, that, that what we do is a balancing act. And uh, a challenge that, that we've witnessed and that we've faced is that some collaborations that emphasize the inclusion of multiple voices and viewpoints um, may result in a performance product that seems like everybody got a turn and everybody's ideas are on stage and maybe it's way too long or maybe the audience feels excluded or doesn't understand what's going on. And we wanna find uh, practices that take that part out of ensemble theater and still um, allow us to end with a cohesive final product. Uh, the approach that we're proposing decentralizes decision making, prioritizes consent, supports collaborators as they navigate creative differences, it's a really holistic, collaborative approach while at the same time advocating for the experience of the audience, unifying ideas and elements into a single, cohesive, legible, quality piece of theater. And those processes that we've developed over the course of two shows is what we're going to share with you today. And we also want to talk about why does this matter? Um, so we imagine that, that you, like us, um, are attracted to making ensemble theater because we have some objections to the conventional s power structures that are embedded in traditional theater making practices. Um, and so we sort of consciously know that, but a question that we pose to ourselves is how do we unconsciously or even consciously reproduce those hierarchical power structures in our processes because of fear, because of lack of time, because um, there's always sort of a rock and a hard place and we fall back into the ways that we were trained instead of being able to embrace and embody our, our more conscious ideals. So part of the reason we think it's important to kind of theorize about the structure of our processes is how we make our work is really key in terms of expressing our social justice values and also creating access for diverse artistic voices. So I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with um, various versions of this cartoon where, um, uh oh, I think this fell away. Um, so the cartoon shows three children trying to look at a baseball game. And this cartoon is used to explain the difference between equity and equality. Um, so in the cartoon, in the first panel, you see there are three kids and they all have exactly the same support, this one cube box. And um, some kids can see the baseball game really well and others can't see it at all. In the second panel, so that's, that's an example of equality, right? We give everybody equal treatment, equal support. And the second panel shows three kids who have 
what we would describe as equitable distribution of resources. They have the resources they need to allow them to access the baseball game. Um, and then, and so that's an example of the idea that equity is maybe a more useful concept than equality because equity um, really evens the playing field for everyone. The third panel, um, you can see the fence is gone. <laughs> and so the third panel is also a way to think about the structural systemic barriers that some groups face to being able to access baseball <laughs> or any other kind of activity. And I think this is really interesting. It's sort of, to me, it maps into a lot of interesting concepts that come from the realm of universal design, which is that we can design our processes so that they're actually useful for all kinds of people. Excuse me? Oh, thank you very much for the tech support. <laughs> um, okay, so that's that's equity um, as a core concept in the processes and structures we're going to describe to you. Um, so next, we want to tell you just a little bit about who we are, so you know where we're coming from. Uh, I'm an Arizona native. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, I've been based in the Bay Area for the past 15 years, but I'm a fifth generation Tucsonan. I was a working child actor in Tucson in the 80s and uh, came to ASU, studied dance with a minor in Spanish and a lot of sketch comedy mixed in somehow. When I went to the Bay Area, it was to do dance theater and I worked quite a bit in many dance companies as a theater person in the dance world. Um, discovered devising and devised theater, became a dance person in the theater world. With Mugwumpin, I've been able to choreograph, teach, perform, collaborate, direct, and Two years ago, when the founder stepped away, I became the artistic director. Um, Mugwumpin has been a home and a family and so many things, and I'm really happy just to be able to stand on this stage where I went to college and share with you what I've been doing in the years since then. It's really a pleasure. And I'd love to connect with Arizona artists in the room because what I've been reflecting on the last few days is that I don't have new friends in Arizona that I didn't grow up with, and I've made my art life in California, so really happy to meet so many people here. Thanks. Okay, and I am um, an educator and a director, and I, I trained as a director, I started directing in high school, and went to an MFA program for new play direction at the University of Iowa. So I learned to direct text-based works, primarily new plays, collaborate with playwrights, but then I also kind of always had this secret devising life, and even before I knew what that was, I was sort of making things from scratch, and usually because I wanted to make feminist work and I couldn't find content um, that I wanted to put on stage, so I would sort of direct a lot of work with playwrights, and then I would sort of go off in the corner and try to figure out how to make my own things. Um, I've been teaching at the University of San Francisco for about 10 years in the Performing Arts and Social Justice program, and that has also been a space where I've really developed my um, my interest in skills as the divisor because we have a really eclectic population, a lot of first generation college students, a lot of women. And even though we are the performing arts and social justice program, we weren't creating enough opportunities for all of our students to be on stage. And so I turned to devising as a, a, a way to not only deal with content that was relevant and meaningful specifically to our campus, but also as a way to work with the talent that I had instead of trying to cram them into the container of an existing work. Okay, and so now we're gonna define our terms for you. So what do we mean when we say dramaturgy? Um, we mean it in a, a pretty expansive way. We think of dramaturgy as the act of meaning making. And we recognize that in a theatrical process, there are a lot of people doing dramaturgy all throughout the process. Sometimes one of them is actually called the dramaturg. Sometimes the director is doing a lot of dramaturgy. Sometimes the um, ensemble creators are doing a lot of dramaturgy. But especially when you're creating devised work and you have just tons of source material and tons of generated material, you need people to help sift through that, to lay structures and um, meanings on top of it and to think through how to present that in a coherent way for an audience. Um, I also, by dramaturgy, I mean um, effective storytelling. As a director, I train students in theatrical composition and I ask them to think about what makes a compelling minute on stage and identify three values, legibility, how clearly an artistic choice is drawn on stage, is expressed, vitality, how much energy or life force a moment has on stage, and then coherence, how the moment connects to the moment before it and the moment after. And that doesn't have to be in a narrative way, it can be in a rhythmic way or in an energetic way, but in order for an audience to have a coherent experience that they can make meaning out of, there has to be care and attention to how 
the moments are sequenced, how they're part of some kind of whole. Um, and then finally, I think a really important role for a, for a dramaturg, a person who's called dramaturg, or for any, any person who can play this role in a process, is to, s is to be an advocate for the audience, to, to hold the audience perspective and point of view as you go through a process so that that doesn't get lost. Um, we talk about the idea that the performers have the micro view of the work, and the directors or the people who are, you know, the offstage who are creators have the macro view, but we also need to remember the audience point of view because the audience members don't have the privilege of being in the process with us. They don't have access to our source material. They only have one time-based experience of the work. And so we always, always have to keep that perspective present in the process. So uh, we consider this dramaturgy three-dimensional for a few different reasons. We nerded out in the meeting all the ways it could be three-dimensional, but the one we'd like to share with you today is the, the three dimensions in this image, um, the flat plane being the artistic agency, who gets to make the decisions. And that is often in flux in relation to time. And as Christine said, we also need to consider the audience experience. So these are the, the three dimensions that we're proposing today that are in conversation with each other that impact and affect each other and, and shift and navigate and negotiate with each other throughout a creative process. I think that most of us have the most experience with time because we have been situating ourselves in relation to time for most of our lives. We're used to looking at schedules or making schedules. Many of us in this room have the experience of building a rehearsal schedule where we navigate people's availability and the resources and all kinds of other factors. So we're not going to talk that much about navigating the, the dimension of time because we are assuming that's where many of us have quite a bit of experience and have already developed our personal preferences around how to do that. Um, the audience experience is also something many of us have some training in, those of us that have studied composition. We have some skills and tools for thinking about how what happens here affects what happens out there and we've got more language and vocabulary for that. Um, but many of us who have some traditional training, which is a, a hierarchical training in, in many artistic disciplines, have less experience creating structures and organizations for artistic agency in a rehearsal process, in a creative process, especially artistic agency as it relates to audience experience and as it relates to time. The main thing that we are proposing today is that we all consider these three dimensions and build our own organizational structures around each one. So if I was a really good animator for the PowerPoint, I'd put a box around each one and then a lot of arrows between saying, you know, how do these things, how are they contained in and of themselves? How do they relate to each other, impact and affect each other? And then I'd make this graphic like m move in many ways so you can just imagine that part. Um, we're going to offer you some of the organizational structures that we created within and around these three dimensions. However, um, beyond this slide, some of the structures that we're offering are examples. Please don't feel that we're imposing anything. We're saying these are some of the organizational structures that work for us. Our main point today is encouraging you to consider um, these three dimensions. And so before we go on, we're going to, to ask you to consider that. So as you think about artistic agency in your creative process, audience experience, and time, um, take a moment to reflect for yourself an area that, that you're really good at, something that um, you feel comfortable navigating or that is conscious and an area where you feel that you are guiding others potentially through a process with confidence. And take a moment to reflect on a place where you feel like it's tricky or complicated or sometimes it feels out of control or out of your awareness as you're working, where something can kind of get run away and go, oh, how did we get here? Um, and then, just rank them a little bit for yourself, and maybe it, it does change in relation to time. Maybe at the beginning of a process, you feel one way, and in the middle or the end of a process, different priorities come to the forefront. 
and take just a moment. We'd love you to re reflect briefly with a partner, someone who's sitting near you, if you can, find somebody and say, in relation to, to these three dimensions, this is one I'm good at, this is one I'm working on, et cetera. Just have a moment of reflection before we go deeper in here. So find someone next to you, take just a moment. Thank you. If both people haven't shared yet, please switch now. Okay, take 10 seconds to wrap up your conversation. And I'm gonna call your attention back to me. If you're just coming into the room, um, hi, I'm Christine Young from the University of San Francisco. Natalie Green, Mugwumpin. And today we're presenting a model that we developed from working on two shows together in the same year um, that we are suggesting might offer some thoughts about how to embed um, equity and also um, attention to audience experience and artistic agency as you progress through theatrical processes. Um, so now we're gonna show you one of the structural models we came up with. Um, do you wanna go to the next slide? So um, we call this the funnel of artistic agency and we're going to describe it to you. Um, we developed this actually consciously in the first show, High Anxiety, which we'll tell you more about in a minute, as a way to think about how we are going to um, progress through the time-based process that we were um, experiencing. Wanna go to the next one and I'll... So time is the access, right? The funnel narrows as we go forward in time. And I'm gonna let Natalie tell you about the segments of the time. So we have the very enjoyable open top of the funnel where we have so many skills and tools for generating material. And um, many, many people are involved in that in many ensemble processes. And as we narrow in, we're building a show, putting it together, starting to edit and refine. This is where things, uh, people often experience a feeling of tightening. And it's often where people's values come through because um, we have this open, enjoyable, collaborative process at the top, and as it narrows, um, there's the idea uh, in, in this model that we have maybe fewer people when we're editing and refining at the end, and then oftentimes what happens is we get to tech and dress, and it's like, no, please be quiet, find your light, and that's that. <laughs> um, so we think about who is inside this funnel when. And oftentimes, the director is, is one of the few people that are straight through the middle, always involved in the decision making, the agency, and um, figuring out what happens. In a traditional process, the performers sometimes get to spend a little bit of time contributing their ideas, but pretty quickly, we find them outside of the place where their, their voices have an impact in the creative process and in the eventual production. In a devised process, we find the performer collaborators are often inside the funnel for longer. Um, this is just a really base intro. What we're gonna do is we're going to talk about um, how complicated it gets. <laughs> See the little, <laughs> sometimes we're in, sometimes we're out, so it, we know that it's not linear. Um, and as opposed to further explaining the model now, we're gonna tell you about these two shows and then come back to this model and show you how this model was used in both productions. So the funnel of artistic agency in action. Here we go. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you about the first show, High Anxiety. So High Anxiety was an original um, evening length work 
that was developed at the University of San Francisco over an 18 month period. There were 24 student artists and seven professional artists involved in creating the work. It had um, a narrative structure with five protagonists. We had an in the theater first act, a site specific second act, and an interactive third act. So we like to call it our kitchen sink show. It we just sort of had every possible theatrical option and trick. Um, and another sort of, um, sort of elder I want to call out is Joan Shirley from Del Arte, um, who uh, talks about theater of place, theater that is deeply rooted both in terms of its content and its form in the place in which it is being experienced. And so that was very much on our minds as we made the show. So the show was about um, anxiety and addiction in college students and how, how, how those things affect them. And the, the, the seed for the show came from an article in our student newspaper about students abusing Adderall to stay up all night on our campus so that they could get their work done. And so I started thinking about that and talking to students and had noticed that there had been a huge uptick in five years of students reporting crippling anxiety on our campus, which is true across the nation. And so we started thinking, you know, what, what effect is anxiety having on us and our, on our population and, and, and how can we make that visible? And then also thinking about the stigma of mental health and what are the barriers that prevent people from asking for help and support. So those were some of the really place-based concerns that went into the making of this work. Um, okay, so Natalie's gonna show you some images while I talk a little bit more. Um, so we knew that, that this, there was danger in going into this territory with students because we're talking about mental health. And in fact, of the 24 students who were attracted to the project, two thirds, three quarters, were open about their perception that anxiety was having a negative effect on their lives. And some of them had clinical diagnoses and some of them were on medication and some of them were in therapy. And so this was an active issue for a lot of the students. So Natalie and I were very conscious in designing our production process. We did not want to put students in a space where they were gonna be continually traumatized by examining the subjects. So we were like, how do we sort of safely, or as safely as we can, go on this journey together when we don't know what we're gonna make, we don't know what we're gonna find. We did all kinds of research, interviews and other kinds of research. So we had a couple of strategies for how to go through the process in a conscious way. The first that I will share with you, which I really recommend when you're dealing with sensitive material, is a ritualized beginning and ending to rehearsal. We began rehearsal in the same way every day with a 10 minute warm up set to a single piece of music. It always happened in exactly the same way. If you were late, you knew exactly where to jump in. Um, we ended every rehearsal with a closing circle that had a physical component. Um, it had a very short check-in for each individual and then a physical sort of cheer that we all did together as we walked back out. We knew it wouldn't necessarily be possible for students to completely leave their experience at the rehearsal room door, but we wanted to give them that sense of safety and bookends and that the rehearsal space was a container for safely exploring these topics but that they could leave them behind. The second thing we embedded in the process is what we call process talks. And we actually put it on the rehearsal schedule. So periodically, about once a week, we would have a chunk of time set aside for us to check in with each other. How's it going? Do you perceive an impact in your life outside the rehearsal room because of working on this material? Um, just sidebar, in the end, the answer was yes, and it was largely positive, and that's a whole other talk about how um, we can collectively process trauma through creating devised work together. Um, so process talks were also a chance to talk about our aesthetic goals and to uh, um, help students recognize when we were shifting from one level of the funnel to the other. So we were extremely explicit and transparent about that and said this is the point where you can contribute these kinds of artistic ideas and choices and now we're shifting to the next phase and this is what's possible in this phase and this is what our, how our roles are going to shift. Um, a final thing that I think we did that was fruitful um, for this process is we, um, allowed the dramaturgical phase, the sort of middle part, to go on a lot longer than we thought it should. Um, I had done devised work with students before, and I'd done this thing I call a dramatur dramaturgical showdown, where the, the people who want to be part of the artistic decision making basically get in a room together for three days, hash through what we have, sequence it, decide what's gonna be kept and what's gonna be jettisoned, and then we go forward into editing and polishing. That work uh, turned out not to take three days, it took three weeks. And it was a little terrifying because we had a deadline. We actually wound up canceling our first weekend of shows. But we felt it was so critical that students who were working on material that was about the subject of their lives and to which they had contributed so much have as much artistic agency as possible as we collectively agreed about what content we wanted to be in the show, what stories we wanted to tell, what perspectives we needed to tell. And there was a lot of wrestling and wrangling because like idiots, we created a five character narrative show with you know, all these other goofy parts. So it took a long time to sort out what was gonna stay and what was gonna go. 
And then finally, when we kind of reached that last phase of the funnel, and we said, okay, great. Now you get to step into performer role, and Natalie and I have it, and we're gonna, we're gonna whip the show into beautiful shape, and we did. But our willingness to kind of let that middle phase last as long as it needed to last was one of the sort of most terrifying, but also most rewarding um, directing experiences that I've had. One of the brilliant things that Christine created for this process was a three semester model. And I wanna offer this to anybody who works in schools, um, in colleges and universities, because it made ensemble created true collaboration, devised theater happen in a university setting in a way that felt safe and healthy for everyone. It was three semesters long. Semester number one, Christine taught documentary theater. She interviewed, her students interviewed, they did all kinds of academic research and um, really ended up with a, a, a body of work, research, source materials, many things that were then handed over semester two, I taught devised theater. And my students and I took all of that information and we got to play without the pressure of a performance. In that play time, we explored the idea, should the show be site specific, if so, you know, if we start in the theater, then where on campus do we go? And how far is too far? And, and how real is too real? And where can audiences be? And we got to play without feeling the pressure of performance in the devised theater class, see what would rise to the top, take a, a go away on break, and then we got to come back and say, okay, let's look at those videos. Let's remember what we loved. Let's let go of what we didn't love. And, and then the students started the rehearsal process in semester number three when we co-directed the show. Some students did all three semesters, some did just one or two. But either way, the rehearsal process that we got into was really supported by two semesters of work leading up to it. And that's how I believe we were able to feel that so many voices were included in the process. Um, and now, oh, and here we are, end of the process, very happy large group of collaborators. Um, the funnel as it was used in high anxiety uh, had Christine and I as directors in there the whole time. And I'm, I'm referring to this as the rehearsal process funnel. I'm not taking the documentary theater course and the devised theater course uh, into account here. In the rehearsal process, the performer collaborators were inside of the funnel for more than half of the time, but there, there was a really clear shift when we said, thank you so much for your contributions. We're gonna direct these scenes now. You might have written the scene, you might have composed this song or choreographed half of this dance, but I'm gonna clean that dance. And we are going to make sure that the show is legible and coherent for our audience. The dramaturg came in in the middle of the process to give Christine and I support and feedback, to do a little bit of writing as necessary to reflect back to us what some of the words meant, especially when they were written by multiple people with multiple influences. And um, our designers in this case had a fairly traditional role. Although we were in conversation with a student composition class that were writing some songs for us, and our set designer was in early meetings. For the most part, we had a traditional role with our designers that they had a lot to respond to. They came in late in the process. We all hustled through tech and had a show. Um, we'll come back to the funnel later, but we wanted to offer that example as how it worked in high anxiety. And now we're getting to the Mugwumpin show. So a few months, do you wanna? Uh, I think I will. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Um, in the Mugwumpin show, which was just a few months later, um, actually the processes were overlapping because Mugwumpin spent about two years in the research and development process for an event of moon disaster, which is the name of a speech, a William Sapphire speech, which is the speech that President Nixon would have read if the astronauts died when they went to the moon. And um, I'll read a tiny bit. Fate has ordained that the men who went to the moon to explore in peace will stay on the moon to rest in peace. It's this whole contingency plan of what he would have said to the nation had they died. So when we went into early investigations, we had the themes of contingency planning and uh, we had all of the moon lore and history and science and magic and started to figure out how those converged. Please wait. It is important to say that um, this moon man here, Soren Santos, had this speech and this show in his back pocket for years. And a part of the process that we went through uh, was Soren saying, I'd like this company to do this show. He's a company member. 
who had only been with Mugwumpin for a few years at that point. And I was new to my role as artistic director, and I said, are you sure? Because I love this idea, and I will run with it, but we will kill all of the babies involved in, in you holding this letter and this speech, and are you okay with that? That, that we're gonna beat it up and regurgitate it, and it might be unrecognizable. And we talked a lot about it, he was okay with it. This is a photo from the very first workshop, and I'm gonna show you all more process photos, you'll see a few production photos, but um, this is the first workshop. He just showed up one day with a moon head, and he said, I think this is a character in the show. And uh, it turns out it was, and we, this is one of our next work in progress showings, site-specific at the Battery in San Francisco. Soren was still playing the Moonhead. Next time we came to a work in progress showing, a theme that we had uh, come to at that point was that, again, feminist director, we thought NASA and science is traditionally male and masculine. Moon lore and mythology and magic is, moon is a female deity. And so why did man want to go and conquer the moon and stick his pole in it? and claim it for his own and race with other men to get there and conquer it. So when that became a theme, we realized that the moon mask shouldn't be worn by a man. And we wanted the moon, the moon to always be portrayed by a woman. So this was the final production. And our moon was a wonderful modern dancer who was actually blind and learned the show with her body. And we just didn't figure out the technology for her to see through it. So she just memorized the show with her body and did it blind, which we also thought was really beautiful and poetic. That's an example of the easy part. I want to talk about the hard parts. <laughs> Parti is an organizing principle. Again, in three-dimensional dramaturgy, we advocate for you to use your own organizing principles as they relate to your processes, your artists, your audiences, and the themes and subjects that you're working with. Parti has worked for Mugwumpin in the past. So Parti is an organizing thought or decision behind an architect's design presented in the form of a basic diagram or a simple statement. The first time Mugwumpin used Parti was at Z Space in 2012. And the show had a giant three-story set that started with 16 Tyvek rooms that the audience was inside of an immersive environment. Then that set lifted up, and the audience was in five rooms. And then that set lifted up, and there was only one room that most of the audience was outside of. And then that lifted up above our heads, and the audience is there on the outside. So that set inspired the Parti for that show. And it really worked in that show. This party helped us to not only understand where the audience would be, but the shape and flow of it also dictated certain parts of the artistic development process. When we started Moon Disaster, we sketched our parties and we thought, what should the party be for this show? So there we are with some of our early sketches. And it became clear early on that the moon itself would be a, a major influence here, the actual moon phases. So we dissected the speech into eight main lines and themes, and we paired those eight main lines and themes with the eight phases of the moon to go, how does the um, contingency plan and idea of this lost history, lost non-existent history, um, exist in relation to the moon themes um, and the moon phases? And there were many, many post-it notes. Uh, when we dug in deeper, we created this mega document that said, okay, what phase of the moon? What part of the speech? What else do we need to include? What is the science and what does the moon look like in that phase? And what do the witches say? What is the magic? And then we tried to create everything within one of those eight phases. So everything we created had to have the look or feel. So we were going deep into our party at that point in the process. And it was not easy because we created a really rigid system and structure, and many of us work really well with those constraints. But it got a little tricky. Um, we also decided somehow the eight phases need to happen twice because it was about life or death, and we had a certain way of working with the space. We were using a theater in a site-specific way. We flipped where the audience went. It was a seven-projector show that had video all around the audience. and. Uh, for this and many reasons, we had this figure eight moon phase party, and we all felt like we were being strangled by it. Every time we had one of these dramaturgical showdowns, we were like, this made so much sense. The reasons we developed this made so much sense, but when we put it all together for an audience, it doesn't work. They're so distinct and, 
And so I called Christine. And now I'm going <laughs> to uh, have Christine talk about the role of the dramaturg in this process. Um, so the show was going up in December. Natalie called me in September. And I was actually too, or no, I think it went up in January. I was too busy to get involved until like November. Um, and she said, it's not working. And you know, we have all these great, we have all this great material and all these great ideas, but it's dead. It doesn't have life. Like, I need help. And so I said, great, I want to come play with you. I love collaborating with you. But I was very nervous about stepping into this process because Mug Wumpin is a super tight ensemble. They've been working together for years. And here I am, a stranger, walking into the room. So at first, I just sort of walked in, and I observed, and I sifted through the material, and I had conversations outside of the rehearsal room with Natalie. And one of the things I said to her is I said, you know, your, your central idea, which is this letter, which is about these two possibilities, these two different time-based outcomes, can only be perceived by the audience if you have characters and if we have some stake in their survival. I was like, without characters and caring whether they live or die, you cannot actually activate the essence of this letter. And so we went back through the material and we, we pulled out these two figures of these two astronauts who were the people who were sort of stranded in space who were communicating back to, um, you know, sort of base station and we sort of pulled them out, and it became a narrative show, which was not really Mugwumpin's thing. They don't really do narrative shows. Um, but it became clear as we started working in that way that the, the, the vitality, there was a huge uptick in the vitality, and the show became more coherent. And you know, what Natalie said to me, she said, I don't want the audience to just walk out and go, wow, that was pretty. And oh, I, you know, I like that moment, I like that moment, but not be able to connect the dots between things. Again, not only through story, but through some sort of sense of being able to perceive the whole, being able to perceive the energy and the forward momentum through the show. So I worked mostly with Natalie, sort of drawing circles around material that I thought connected. They worked in rehearsal. That was the stuff they leaned into and edited. And we kind of introduced the funnel idea sort of mid-process to the ensemble members and said, hey, we think this is what's needed here because we need you to step into character and speak from inside character. I'm going to disagree a tiny bit. Mugwumpin had been operating with a funnel idea for a while, but it hadn't been clarified to the performer collaborators when they, even if the show was their idea, when they needed to step out of the decision-making process so that we could pull it into form. Right, so I think that was the thing that happened sort of midway through the process. We said, okay, we're making explicit how the roles are going to shift. Do you want to say anything else? I wanted to offer one more funny anecdote in relation to time, because when we started working with uh, the moon landing, we knew we didn't want the piece to take place in the 60s or 70s. We wanted it to be either ambiguous in relation to time or, or modern day. And we, I really, I work a lot with, um, with youth and elders in my work uh, at USF and through nonprofits in San Francisco, and I thought, we can't be all young and middle-aged people telling this story. We need to have at least one cast member who remembers the moon landing, and we need to have at least one cast member that embodies the uh, innocence and joy that that event uh, evoked for people historically. And so we wanted a, a kid, and, and we wanted an older adult in the cast. And just to say this in relation to time, um, in the works in progress, the, the child performer did embody um, the hope and innocence. And in the two-year development process of the show, she became a teenager. <laughs> and so one other thing that was shifting, and she looked different. And I had to keep stepping back and say, okay, she's only six months older, but she's way taller. So to an audience who doesn't know how old she is, she reads like a teenager. And so that also late in the game really had to change some of what we'd created. Again, it's all gotta be in relation to time because nearing the end of the process, we thought she used to say that same sentence and it would read differently because now she's got attitude and now she's taller and now it's, it's a whole different thing. So she became the um, sort of digital manager character. She was the tech nerd because she was always on her phone and her gadgets and it, it worked, but it was a late in the game uh, shift and it was because of a dramaturgical process that forced us to reflect on what was actually happening on stage versus what we had wanted to happen or what we had happened in an earlier draft of the show. Um, the last thing I want to say about this piece was that we were particularly proud of having had the designers in the process early on because it allowed us to create images like this one 
and because um, we're theater people, I'll give you, I'll give this away. There was a scrim in front of what used to be the seats in the audience, and it was all booby trapped back there. The audience sat where the um, performers traditionally are on, in the stage space, and the scrim seemed like a wall for most of the show. And then near the uh, near the end, when the astronauts were dead or lost in space, they went back behind the scrim, and we projected their faces on the scrim. And then the lights rigged back there. It was a collaboration between video lighting, choreography, uh, performers, writers. Um, and we're not going to be able to show video today, but I'm about to upload this on the Mugwumpin website. So check it out if you're curious. OK, so now we want to apply the funnel of artistic agency to this process. So again, Natalie, as the director of the piece, had sort of a clear line of artistic decision making all the way through the time. Um, based process. Um, so her performers and collaborators, because this is the nature of their ensemble, they also had a high degree of artistic decision making pretty late, pretty much all the way up to that last phase, which is like the get it ready for the audience um, polishing phase. Um, and the designers also were, as Natalie said, um, involved from the very beginning and were making lots of artistic decisions. Um, I came in as the dramaturg kind of in the middle towards the end, right? So w there we all are. Um, and then one of the things that, is this where we're showing the other negative space? Oh, no, not yet, okay. Okay, so commonalities between the shows that we wanted to point out. So one of them is that we use dramaturgs, right? So we, we're thumbs up for dramaturgs and devised processes. Um, we think they're really awesome because they help um, recognize what's actually happening versus what we, again, would like to happen or might have fooled ourselves into thinking is happening, and they can, they can um, stand in the shoes of the audience and speak from the point of view of the audience. Deep personal investment of collaborators. Another reason why having a codified structure is so important. We did shows about sensitive subjects and subjects that were so um, dear aesthetically, and so there was a high degree of emotional stakes in all of our artistic decision making. So we needed this clear structure so that we could all stay friends <laughs> and future collaborators with each other. Um, expansive subject matter. It matters when you're working on such vast topics to have organizing principles that help you sift through your material and, and organize your thinking about your process because otherwise it's so easy to get lost and go down rabbit holes. Um, and then I think, you know, this is probably true in many, many devising processes, but commonalities between these two projects were that we had this really broad and rich idea generation phase with research and images and lots of people contributing to our collective source material bucket. Um, and then we had really a bigger challenge with the editing part, right? How do we sift through this? How do we impose coherence on it? And how do we, um, you know, how do we shift gears from this wonderful generation phase to the like winnowing and um, sort of clarifying phase? Um, and then I guess a final thing that these pieces shared is that we we wanted to put strong work on stage. That was that was our mission. We we were committed to um, pursuing equity in the process, but we were super committed to putting outstanding work on stage that was so refined and aesthetically complex and satisfying for an audience. So that was a, a value that we held very dear in both processes. So now we want to look at these two funnels uh, next to each other because um, we notice in the high anxiety, the University of San Francisco piece, that the performers had artistic agency in the process for the first half and then were outside of the funnel in the second half of the process. There's positives and negatives to that, but I want to point out here in the in event of moon disaster, the Mugwumpin funnel, how crowded it looks at the end. So many people with so much artistic agency, really close to showtime. And um, I want to point out now that the negative space, what is outside of the funnel, is really, really important for people as well. So what happens out there? People memorize their lines and they're blocking. They find the motivation and intention for the moments inside the show. They find momentum and stamina for the piece as a whole. They make discoveries with each other. That All of that traditional stuff that actors do is still really important in our work. And so we will also need to ensure that our ensemble members have the time and the space and the support that they need to do that work even if it's hard for them to let go of a certain amount of agency, when they do, they get to drop into their roles in a different way that's important to them as performers and important to us that want to put really quality work on stage. 
So I just want to point out that what happened in Moon Disaster, when we had so many people contributing so many ideas so long, <laughs> for so long, in the end, they were bummed that, you know, in our last design run, people had scripts in hand and, and were coming to tech still working on memorizing their lines because you know, we were making some script changes because we had been trying to include everyone's voices for so long. And even though I didn't want to take, for example, the person who offered this show idea to this company and say, mm, I actually don't want to ha have you be a part of this decision right now because as hard as it was to sort of make that distinction, he also needed to memorize his lines and learn his role. And so we want to advocate for everything that happens outside of the funnel being highly, highly important as well. And that one of our main jobs is helping people transition inside and outside. And I actually just want to make uh, one other note about how my role changed in an event of moon disaster because we were so tight on time when we got down to that last phase of the performer stepping to the roles. I actually, and this happened kind of organically, jumped into a directorial role um, at the very, very end with a couple of performers who said, hey, can I talk to you for a minute? I have to make a transition from this piece to that piece, and I don't have a way to think about that because they didn't used to be next to each other. So can you help me figure out, like, emotionally, how can I get from one piece to the next? This one is over here, that one's over there. And so we, like, went off in a corner, we worked together. And so, you know, because we, like, kind of needed all hands on deck, I shifted out of drama, I mean, checked in with Natalie, checked in with everybody. It's like, do you want me to step into this role now? Okay, great, I can do this, I can help you, I can support you as you build a scaffold for yourself as a performer. And that was great because I had seven projectors and seven designers to deal with. <laughs> um, how is this work feminist, Christine? Oh, right, okay, that's my, <laughs> I forgot that's my part. Um, okay, so why do we call it feminist and not humanist or collaborative? Um, so a couple things. So one of the things, one of the ways in which we're defining it as feminist um, is the checks and balances that we employed. We employed it because we were co-directors, so we had checks and balances with each other, or director and dramaturg, likewise, um, toggling between perspectives and recognizing that in some ways it takes more than one brain in the room to be conscious of when we are overemphasizing one perspective over another. And um, so I think that's really helpful, is when you have someone else to share that job with of trying to be sure that you are looking at the piece and the process from multiple perspectives. Um, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's our favorite image. Um, so uh, I love um, Diana Lipmosovic, who's the artistic director of Dach Theater in Serbia, says that as artists we ride two horses. One is the horse of technique and the other is the horse of inspiration. And when one gets tired, we can um, ride on the other for a while. Um, so likewise, I'd say uh, with feminist directing and dramaturgy, uh, we ride two horses. We ride the horse of creating an environment where all the artists in the room can do their best work and being supportive and connective and um, recognizing and, and validating others' artistic agency. And then we also ride the horse of craft, of being able to um, do the work of making artistic decisions and figuring out how to best use our resources and figuring out, you know what, actually we need to shift gears now. This is what we need now. So I sort of argue that as a feminist director that I have to have traditional directing tools, and I also have to have this much more sort of lateral, I think horizontal leadership was a phrase that was used yesterday, this, this willingness and desire to share that power laterally as often as I possibly can. So we wanted to return to this image one last time and remind you that the organizational structures that we've used might not be the right ones for you, but we wanna encourage you to consider that all of the structures we have around time are things that we've practiced or that we've been forced to get good at. Audience experience, also something perhaps that, that we're in a explicit conversation with. However, artistic agency and deciding when, what, who, and how long your artists are involved in the creative decision-making process is something that might need more shape and that that shape should be responsive to the subject matter and the identities of the artists and audience and many other factors. So we wanna encourage you to have your organizational structures. And lastly, um, Mugwump in, in our values, we're all about questions. We value questions more than answers. So we wanted to end with a few questions. Is three-dimensional dramaturgy performance process design, to put it into other language? How does time-based craft meet equity-based principles? 
and how do we operationalize equity, diversity, and inclusion in our creative processes? Uh, we are so lucky today to be joined by uh, two women who are going to be talking with us. We want to take one minute first to see if there's questions specifically about this work. We're going to take just a few minutes, and then we will uh, actually have a panel open it up to further questions and conversation with our wonderful colleagues. Um, so are there any curiosities specifically about what we've shared so far? Or anything we can explain better or go back? Yeah, Steph. Uh -huh. Sure. So he has, question, he has questions about the party model. And um, for anybody who came in late or just a review, a party is a concept from architecture where as opposed to all the complicated drafts and plans, it's one simple image that you could sketch on a napkin that represents the, the building or the creation. And um, what Mugwumpen has often used is a party model for our shows. Is it possible to go back there? So um, we have found that that helps us in our decision-making processes because we can easily know if something won't fit within our party even if it's related, even if it's one great way of investigating the source material, because we know that we can be inspired by whatever source material we're working with, and there's so many directions we can go with that inspiration, with that source material. And if you have a party, which is a larger organizing structure, one of these shapes, that we say, no, we've committed to this as the shape of our show, then we, as you're working with your source material, you can also have the larger concept of the show in mind. Actually, I, I want to say something about that, because I think it sounds more mysterious than it is. Um, I think actually we had a party in high anxiety, and the party wasn't a shape, it was a phrase. I would say, high, this is before we had cast it, before we had any like concept. I said, high anxiety is a show about five protagonists who are dealing with anxiety in their daily lives. It has a site, it has a, in the theater first act, a site specific second act, and in their act a third act. It's called high anxiety. So as we worked, we're like, well, what do we need more of? We're like, well, we have enough high, we need more anxiety. Or, well, we've got a three act structure, so we need to work in act two. What is act two? We only had act one. You know, so it was kind of arbitrary, but I kept going back to it. I was like, okay, well, I'm building the show in relation to this statement that I made. I think that parties are often found intuitively. And then you can use it as a tool to give shape and coherence to your work. And you know, you also can abandon it if it doesn't work. But it, it, I think for me, it helps, it helps me wrap my brain around what's happening. Because you look at material that you've made, beautiful material, and you could organize it in multiple ways. You can make multiple shows out of it. So why this show and not that show? The party is sort of your, it's your, your lens that you're looking at your material through. Yeah. Yeah, probably. I mean, that you could certainly think of it that way. I mean, it depends a little bit on, on, on how you communicate and perceive the world, right? I'm actually a language-based person, which is why my party is a statement. Natalie's really into imagery, and I think it makes sense that she likes shapes. I would offer my personal experience with mission statement and say yes as a party, because with Mugwumpen, I was involved in redrafting a mission statement when I was a company member without knowing that I would later become the artistic director and be in charge of enacting that mission. And I'm so grateful that I was able to draft that mission statement before I knew I would have the responsibility of carrying it out in the world because I know it really reflects my values. And now I, I go back to that so often in this role. Okay, we're gonna take one more question before we invite our colleagues. Sure, so the question was, can we repeat the, our definition of the time part of three-dimensional dramaturgy? We talked today a lot about artistic agency and how that relates to audience experience. The third dimension that we're proposing is time. And I skipped over it quickly, but I, I will add to that that um, our rehearsal schedule is an organizational structure for time. But how does our rehearsal schedule relate to the creative process and the product that we aspire to have. An example of that is uh, people who work site specifically, how often do you work on site or off site and how does that impact the work? Uh, another example of that is that the 
agency, uh, the funnel model that we proposed is directly in relation to time because people's artistic agency changes as we get closer to inviting the audience in for the experience. Um, I'll, I'll mention one other tool that we used um, in high anxiety, which I'm a huge fan of, especially in the university context when devising, and that is the work in progress showing. So um, we used a process in high anxiety that I used in another show I created at USF, which is we had a work in progress showing every week. And um, we said, actually maybe that wasn't quite true, but that was the name, I think it didn't turn out that way, but it was pr public. private, private work in progress showing. It was pretty frequently. And I would say to the students, so, um, so this is a show. This is the show we can make today. Because you know, we all have these sort of fantasies of like our ideal process, but in fact, time is the fundamental boundary of all processes. You know, you have, you know, you booked the theater, you paid the deposit, like the audience is coming on this date. And so I wanted to teach the students that there's no future ideal, there's only now. There's what can we, what coherent, vital, um, legible work can we put on stage based on the source material today, knowing what we know and having what we have today. And then, oh gosh, we're so lucky, we, now we have more time, we have another audience coming in another week, now we can go back in, we can edit more. And so I would say that's another way to think about time is, you know, time is actually our most precious resource. So as you think about your processes, don't assume you know how you'll use time. You may have, uh, there may be alternative ways you can think about your time um, based on your, your goals for your project. I thought of one more thing. One of my mentors always says that time is the enemy of the theater. And if you think about the other saying, keep your friends close but your enemies closer, I think that we can all use more skills to translate uh, the experience, uh, time-based making and time-based models in relation to our values and our goals and desires as artists. Okay, so we would like to bring up our wonderful colleagues to, um, can we get a little more light? We're gonna move downstage and it's hard to see you all. Um, is there any way we can get some house lights up? This is it. That's okay. Some of you are in the spotlight, so prep some questions. Cool. Yeah, sure. Yeah, first of all, I'd just like to say thank you for sharing this presentation with us. Um, as someone who is really interested Tice. in artistic process design. It's really exciting to um, have a session focused on that. So, um, let's say it. It's casual. Uh, so my name is Joya Scott. I'm a faculty member here at uh, ASU School of Film, Dance, and Theater. Um, my artistic home outside of uh, my work as an instructor is um, been with a company called Orange Theater, which is based here in Phoenix, Contemporary Performance Ensemble. Um, I'm a director, dramaturg, producer, and i um, really excited to respond to some of the issues you brought up. Hi, I'm Carrie J. Cole. I teach at Indiana University of Pennsylvania in Indiana, Pennsylvania, home of Jimmy Stewart. It's a wonderful life starting um, first of November through <laughs> the new year. Um, and now we don't worry about the fact that it's a town named after a state or vice versa. So I wear several hats um, and I'm so excited about having some new language to talk about how I do what I do. So thank you so much for that. Um, I am a dramaturg, director, fight choreographer, production manager, um, and some of those uh, are sometimes dissonant with each other. Mm. Um, so looking at that funnel, um, I began thinking, um, in more than three dimensions and in orbits and how these ideas orbit each other. Yes. So um, so I, I think I'll just stop there. But unless you, why don't I just jump in with a question for, for, for you? Um, because I'm struck because um, uh, both of these examples are both um, uh, uh, different kinds of processes and different kinds of um, uh, institutions for lack of a better word. Um, and as somebody who uh, works in devising both in an educational institution and outside of it, I find that the, those structures um, are really um, uh, sometimes constraining in the educational institution. So thank you for giving me tools to advocate for a, um, a, th a three semester process. That's so exciting. <laughs> Um, uh, but uh, one of the things that you said, Christine, really struck me in terms of 
um, when we get th to those moments of uh, uh, pinch points and tensions, we fall back on our training. And given those two things, I, I just wonder if, if you can articulate a little bit um, of how uh, you may see the model that you're putting forward to students in your classes as um, uh, an opportunity to reframe what, what the next generation of, uh, of performance makers are falling back on. Um, sorry, you chose. Um, so as I mentioned, I teach um, theatrical composition and I also direct main stage plays um, at, on campus. And uh, the whole 10 years that I've been there, I've really reflected a lot about how, how much it matters to Im uh, bring my feminist principles into the directing room. And not just because of the kind of work I choose and not just because I like to power share, but I need to make explicit and visible to students the fact that uh, the way we make the work completely influences what the work is and how it's received, as well as influences what kind of relationships we can have creatively. And so little by little, I've been trying to figure out how to explain this to students because every student comes to us from, a, a, from training in a hierarchical model. Every student thinks that leadership means having all the answers and having the artistic vision and being more important than other people in the room. And as an educator, I know that when students are afraid, when they're like lizard brain and you know, amygdala is triggered, they don't learn as well. So there's this interesting balance between making it visible to them what's happening and then also you know, not telling them more than they need to know <laughs> in certain moments so they don't freak out. So I'm still thinking about that. I've only actually devised two full-length shows in 10 years. One of the reasons is because it takes a lot of resources. It's kind of exhausting. Um, I'm not sure if I've answered your question, but I think, I think to me, um, the other thing I want to tell students, and I believe this, and this sort of is the question at the end, I believe that we create our processes anew for every project we make. We may not realize that. We may have habits and patterns that we repeat over and over again. But every project has a unique series of goals, resources, and limitations. And so also because I help students with their capstones where they create their own work, I say to them, listen, it's all about project design. What do you want this experience to be? If you're the instigator, the leader, you are basically building the ship and inviting everybody else to get on it with you. So, so what kind of journey do you want to have? What kind of experience do you want to have? And if you don't think about that consciously, then you're in for some rough, you know, some rough, you're all gonna be thrown up over the side of the boat. <laughs> like, nobody really wants that. So it's your, it's your obligation as an artistic leader to think consciously about your process and to, and to share that with the people that you're working with. Now I'm thinking about what you just said and not my question. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm having trouble choosing a question because I have both conceptual questions and nuts and bolts questions. So we'll see what we have time for, yeah. Um, I think I'm gonna start with a conceptual question. Um, I, I, it, it might be a two-part question, but I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about what your definition of artistic agency is, because I think that's so core to uh, what you're describing, and I know that those ter that term um, probably has a lot of different possible interpretations. I, I agree it has many possible interpretations, and so I'm gonna build a short and incomplete list. So I think it's about decision-making, I think it's about who gets to ask critical questions, um, potentially, uh, uh, specifically questions that might have big impact in the project, questions that can, can affect change, um, that can dismantle things that were already created, flip things upside down. Um, and, and that's coming from my experience in Mugwampen where we're all about finding the right questions to ask. Um, and and the feeling of occasionally feeling wounded because maybe we've gone on building something to a certain point and a question gets asked that just makes everything, all of that work go away. So who gets to ask critical questions when is big for me. And, um, and contributing new ideas and, and advocating for those ideas. I think we don't want artistic agency to be whoever has the loudest voice. Oh, this person's gonna fight for their idea the hardest. <clears throat> so that's how the show's gonna go, because that energy is not necessarily useful for every process or production. 
So how do we allow for people's voices, preferences, aesthetics, desires, and questions to come forth in relation to all those other things? Um, and I think that agency also partners with investment. So back to high anxiety, you know, there was no show. We said it was a three-act show. So we spent act one developing our character journeys. That was great. Act two, everybody, um, sort of like Fafu and her friends, got to follow a character out of the theater and track their journey in a site-specific environment. And then we're like, and what the, f what the heck is act three? Like, w what happens, right? We want there to be some sort of a climax payoff. We've created stakes for the characters, so we know we need to have some way of seeing what changes or doesn't for the characters in Act 3, but what's the structure we'll use? We knew we didn't want to return to the theater and have it be the same as it was in Act 1. Something has to transform or it's going to feel disappointing. So we tried a couple different contexts. We're like, okay, well maybe Act 3 is a funeral for one of the characters. Maybe one of them committed suicide because of their inability to deal with the anxiety they're experiencing. We tried that on for a while. Some people liked it. Some people hated it. One of the students involved in the show had a brother who had committed suicide. We scrapped it. We said, we can't possibly use this. And then there was this moment where like nobody has an idea. And we said, you know what? We cannot go forward unless we can all find an idea we can all um, live with and agree with. Like Natalie and I could come up with something. We came up with a couple other ideas. We got lukewarm reception. We we're like, if you are not invested in Act 3, the show is going to suck. So we, that was sort of part of what made the dramaturgy take three weeks. We're like, we, we had to test drive a whole bunch of ideas, and then we, we didn't think our way into Act 3, we felt our way into Act 3. And when we landed on it, it happened pretty spontaneously. We're like, oh, Act 3 is a party. The audience comes back, and there's a party in progress. And in, over the course of the party, there's going to be sort of a mild overdose issue, and there's also going to be an opportunity to see how the different characters' anxiety is triggered by the party, and then there's going to be a fight, and you know that sort of got us to our climax. And the audience is on stage, so they come and they get handed a plastic cup. So they, when they re-enter the theater, they're entering the party, and they're party guests. And then the, the show unfolds um, with them as a part of it for quite a bit of Act 3. So I wouldn't say we force them to have artistic agency, but we, we sort of strongly demand it. We're like, you can't, you can't step out of the decision-making process yet until everyone has contributed to deciding that this is the story we want to tell in Act 3. And then once we got to that point, and we knew that we had investment, then it was actually possible to shift and to say, okay, now you can step into your roles more, and you don't have to participate, or you know, you can step away from, from having the artistic decision-making obligation. But without that investment, we knew we weren't going to be able to get to a point where we had a really coherent show. Joy, is there part two to the question? Well, it's, it's more of a thought that's not fully formed yet, but um, I'll give it a shot. I'm wondering, you know, obviously this d the division of labor that at some point in your funnel um, is, is strongly implied, right, or, or maybe required. Um, I'm wondering if, I mean, it seems like it's a matter of scale that artistic agency changes in certain roles at certain times in different ways. So the definition of artistic agency for a collaborator performer at the beginning involves um, you know, as you described, right, uh, having uh, a greater say in um, the big questions of the show, perhaps, right? Having some uh, decision-making say in, in what the piece, how the piece is structured, perhaps. But then as the funnel shifts in, it's not that the, art to, to me, it's, it's interesting, it's not like the artistic agency of that performer goes away, but that it, it zooms in on their, in what you described as the negative space. I think of another way of framing that, which is that it, it kind of zooms in on the moment to moment micro of the performance, which is equally, in my mind, um, full of agency. Mm -hmm. But in a, in a, um, yeah. And so it's not necessarily that the, they are outside of the cone of agency maybe, but that they, um, are focusing on the micro moment to moment construction of a performance, which is a different sort of it. And I'm wondering if um, our definitions of artistic agency could be expanded mm. and could be, um, could be maybe, uh, because I'm thinking about how we distribute power and how we perceive power as distributed. These are the thoughts that, that you've provoked, right? It's not a fully formed concept yet, but I think um, I'm wondering if, if Maybe that leads into a nuts and bolts question, which is how you explain this process to your different populations you're working with. Mm -hmm. If there's a difference between how you explain uh, the funnel with um, 
with students versus professionals mm -hmm. and um, how you create buy-in to that, those, those different phases of your process. So one of the things I think that is kind of revolutionary for me thinking about this is this idea that roles in the theater change over time, right? The director at the beginning of the process has different tasks to do than at the end, as do the performers. Um, and so I think that's something that really you can share and teach students and say, you know, directors at the beginning of the process, your job may be to create the most hospitable working environment possible so that you build trust with everyone in the room, everyone feels like they can speak up and share their points of view, that's your most important job. And then later, your most important job is to make sure that this performer has everything they need to do their best work in this particular moment on stage. So I think that is really, and I think we all know that, but then again, to make it explicit and to teach it to students. And I think your point is really well taken. It's not that you lose artistic agency, it's that the, the scope of it or the, the focus of it changes. And so you could also look at that funnel as like a lens, right? A lens makes an image legible. And actually, uh, my son is actually taking physics, conceptual physics right now, so I know a lot about lenses because I'm his physics buddy. He has to explain it to me and then he gets his homework checked off. So um, I know this, that when you focus the light through a very narrow aperture, it produces a very strong, clear image. And if the light gets to go through quite a wide aperture, it's very diffuse and fuzzy. So this goes right back to legibility. This is why we have the funnel. We have to focus our energy so that our image is very strong and clear for the audience. And so artistic agency, again, isn't about exclusion, it's about contributing to that focus. And so you could say, in a sense, that everybody's getting more focused as we go through the process. The actors are getting more focused from the whole show to their specific role in the show. And the director's getting more focused from their conceiving of the whole process to thinking from the point of view of the audience. To respond to the nuts and bolts question, how this is presented uh, with different ensembles, I think students are used to being told the way it is. And so there's something uh, that's a little bit easier about saying, all right, this is what your role will be here. And it's like looking at a syllabus. In this week, this is how this will shift. And then we get here. It's like the end of a semester. So it's easier in some ways. And working with professional ensembles, um, I find that it is appreciated because when people are clear what is expected of them and what is allowed of them, it allows them to bring their best selves forward. And when we're all working with our best selves, we're better collaborators and we end up with a better product at the end of that lens. I get the groan occasionally of like, Natalie brought out the post-its again, right? Like I've got the big post-its with the little post-its and all the maps and all these models and saying, all right, what week are we gonna do this and when are we gonna shift from that to that? And I find that that's valuable time to spend in rehearsal. And I understand that some actors are resistant to process being made visible or to their roles being made explicit. However, it creates boundaries that are really helpful for collaboration. I to follow up a, a little bit uh, more nuts and bolts. We've been talking a lot about uh, directors, dramaturgs, and uh, performer collaborators. Um, but uh, one of the things that I find uh, is often particularly challenging is um, uh, the where and when and how context of um, uh, integrating, integrating your collaboration with designers, um, uh, particularly designers who may be more used to working in a, a non-devising model. Um, and for me then, and oh, I can't tell if it, this is gonna be a question or a comment, yeah, we'll find out. Um, but for me, uh, the idea of agency um, uh, then has to be coupled with, uh, with trust. And we've talked about trust and that, um, uh, that lovely moment yesterday where we were talking about um, uh, collaboration builds at the uh, speed of trust. Um, and so, um, uh, particularly with with seven projector projections going on, um, uh, I guess it, the nuts and bolts question is um, uh, how how and when did that get integrated, and in terms of content development, when did that happen in the process? Uh, because I think that that's something that um, uh, can be so challenging when you're leaving things open ended uh, if uh, you're um, uh, uh, making decisions very late in the game that fundamentally affect um, uh, t uh, tangible design choices and keeping the designer's um, uh, agency and, and tr trust in that. 
Um, so Natalie should respond to this, but I think one of the things we might be talking about is what decisions need to be made when. And I think it's very astute to point out that a seven projector show doesn't happen well unless you have those designers involved from a very early point. Um, we had the benefit of our Mugwumpen's former managing director, Wol Wolfgang Wachalowski, had been the technical director of the theater. And for the years that he was a technical director of Z Below in San Francisco, he had been looking at the space and dreaming of using it in a certain way. And so we, knew when we decided we wanted to do the show there, we sat with Wolfgang in the theater and he said, what about putting the audience on stage, putting a scrim in front of the seating? Then you feel like you're in a really small black box and you have the space beyond the scrim to play with whenever you're ready, but otherwise we can project on all four walls and the audience can be in the center. Because the, qu the question had been, how do we make people feel like they're in outer space when they're in a very small space? And so to create that expansive uh, sensation, and that was a lot of feedback that we got from the piece, that people were like, I had no idea where I was. It was disorienting in a good way. And uh, that was because of that early inv involvement and investment of the designer saying, and me saying, in the budget, really? How many projectors? Are you crazy? Um, but we figured it out, and I think that his continual um, it, it made so many of the decisions clear and possible because we knew where we wanted the audience in relation to the work, in relation to the space, and how we wanted to use projection. Even if we didn't know what would be projected, we knew that we were going to be using video to create an immersive environment. I will say if I was a proper academic, I would study Mugwumpen and write some kind of treatise about dramaturgy for physical theater because one of the things that came up for me watching them work it was like being on a film set. There was no one person who could possibly imagine what the audience would experience would be. We sort of like had to like lean our heads together and try to like collectively feel that. And so what I was curious about, back to this idea of negative space, I was like, huh, what are the, the aesthetic and emotional impact of a theatrical moment that's being realized with seven video coming from seven projectors, plus live performance, plus live music, plus the audience in site-specific space and their multiple vantage points. I, no one can imagine that. So what parts of it can be imagined and decided and what parts have to be left open, sort of or have to be known to be in that negative space? And so I started thinking about that and I think the sort of um, aesthetic tools from the choreographic realm are so useful because we think about layering, right? And we think about juxtaposition and how that creates meaning and sensation, but as a, dramaturg who mostly works with text and narrative, I was like, wow, this is mind-blowing. Like, how do you predict and think about when you have to make certain decisions given how the design is so central and how so much of it cannot be um, anticipated until it actually exists in the space with the people? And lastly, it is about trust. Thank you for bringing that up, that uh, we didn't know exactly how it was gonna turn out or come together, but we knew that the people that we invited into the room were all trusted artists. And, and we put our faith that when our ideas came together within these structures and organizational models, uh, that they would come together for aesthetic quality. I'm wondering. Yeah, I mean, I, I thought we should open it up perhaps to sure. see if the audience had any other questions that have come up. I'll just pause for a minute. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, first, we have to think about how to tell the story in a way that is going to be legible to others. I mean, this was the, this is the first time we've done that. Uh, we've been talking to each other about it for a while, so yeah, hopefully. And I would be... Thank you, and I, I would be happy to share some of these materials with people who are in the room, if you feel comfortable with that, so please come and find us. Sure. sure. Yeah, thank you. Other questions or comments?
so a, a brief uh, wrap up of the question has to do with uh, designers, agency, time, and interaction. Yeah? Thank you. I ha also just have to give a shout out because our designers are up for three Theater Bay Area Awards on Monday. Um, so that investment and that trust in those designers uh, has some recognition now. Oh, Wolfgang Wachalowski for video projection, Ray Oppenheimer on lighting design, and Teddy Holsker on sound design. And I would say, interestingly, um, in relation to this question, each of those three designers had a different uh, level of involvement and length of involvement with the process. As I mentioned, Wolfgang had been the technical director of the theater. So the entire structure of how the show w would incorporate video in relation to the audience and how the performers would be in relation to video and audience was known or at least um, thought about from the beginning of the process and considered in every decision that we made. So we knew that video would be deep and important and we, we rolled with that. However, he was not, we, we ha were on a scrappy budget and we were in many different rehearsal spaces. We weren't setting up projectors and rehearsals on a regular basis. So there was a lot of trust. He watched many more rehearsals. We also had live feed in there, so there was sometimes uh, pre-created images, and there was also live feed video. There were tons of Google Docs, but the performers didn't work with video until uh, really very close to tech rehearsal. And um, we canceled a preview because we weren't ready. Um, because of that, that how we needed the performers to understand how the video worked. The 14-year-old, the 13-year-old was operating the live feed camera. Um, also, I don't know if you remember, but um, in the high anxiety process, the designers were really involved more traditionally because they had less time to contribute. They were, um, you know, most of them were guests who were coming in on contract. I think I go back actually to investment. So, you know, we showed you these models that we reverse engineered. We're like, oh, we think this is what happened. But then how was it determined where people started in the funnel? And I think it has a lot to do with investment, the amount of time each of those collaborators had to invest in the project. So for Wolfgang and Ray, who are core company members of Mugwumpin, who were there from the very beginning when the company first decided they would do the show, you know, their investment is high and therefore they are all the way through the funnel. For our designers who were being jobbed in, who were lovely and who maybe came to more rehearsals and work in progress showings than they might have, and I made that clear when I hired them, they still had less to, con that less to invest, so they, they less time to invest so they were able to have a more traditional relationship with the material. And so I'm thinking about that too. It's not that one is better than the other. It's that you have to again look at your resources. You're like, well these three people can go down the whole road with this project, but these two people who are awesome can only come in for this part. So then, then let's just be explicit about that. Well that's awesome, so you're gonna come at this part, so then this is the zone where you can contribute. And these folks who are here for the whole journey, we're gonna be contributing these other ways because we're able to invest that much of our, our time and energy. I know we're quickly running out of time, uh, but one of the things that um, I've been thinking about as we've been uh, been talking and, and being able to see your model that works so well with all of these things is that um, you can then plug and play different uh, models in here. So for instance, a great example of uh, the investment trust and interaction with designers is when if suddenly you uh, end up collapsing the time. Uh, I, I devised a piece um, uh, where we had 21 days of rehearsal before an audience. Um, so our designers were in the rehearsal all of the time. I gave up our, our, our I didn't give up, I, uh, collaborated with our designers on our biggest, our longest stretches of time. So as a director, I was um, uh, outside of watching their process to have that integrate into uh, the development of the narrative structure. Uh, they were creating, we had a student designer creating masks based on the movement of the actors, um, uh, time shifting her build process. So she was sitting watching rehearsal building the masks. Um, so, uh, and that was what gave her agency, and that's that's why I go back to this orbiting. So, thank you so much for offering this this model. Thank you to the uh, Net staff um, for uh, giving you this time and space, and and asking us uh, to be yeah. a part of it. Yeah, thank you so much. I think so many projects and processes live or die based on the ability to talk about 
people's investment, about the process, about what each person is contributing, each role. So I think this framework is really helpful. Thank you. Thank you to HowlRound. <laughs> Shout out to everyone on HowlRound. And please, uh, we'd love to continue this conversation. Obviously, we love talking about this and nerding out. So please find the Mug Wumpin website. If you're here in person, come and talk to and us. We'd love to chat. Are we sure we having a break now? We're, we're skilled at using time. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Joya, Carrie. Thank you, everybody, Thank you for all. being here.